So the Lempel-Sif Welsh algorithm is a variant of this family of compression methods, the Lempel-Sif family, that is arguably the cleanest uh, and nicest. It's also very practical. It used to be protected by a patent, so it it was a bit controversial uh, how to use it. It was uh, legal trouble, but this is all uh, gone and passed now. Um, the patent has expired because the method was old enough. So it's uh, this is no longer an issue. Um, I mentioned last time that it's a variable to fixed encoding. We take a variable length thing part of the source text and encode it with a fixed number of bits. And we'll uh, use this typical choice of, of 12 bits, but that is a, a parameter you can tweak and play with. And that can be, uh, this variable to fixed should be contrasted to Huffman where it was fixed to variable. But really now, how do we do this? And that's the interesting part. So this is where you should uh, wake up and pay close attention. We maintain a dictionary that is uh, a collection of strings of phrases. These are all substrings of the text that we're compressing. Um, at most, two to the k entries. Initially, we will only have some uh, entries for single characters from the source alphabet, but this dictionary will get filled over time. Uh, and the indices in the dictionary, the order in which we add things to the dictionary, that will be our code words. So we reserve the first code words, the first uh, little sigma code words are assigned to the single characters of the alphabet. Uh, and all the other code words, so this is usually much smaller than 2 to the k. Um, and uh, all, the other, uh, all the other slots in the dictionary are reserved for phrases that we will add and that depend on the text. Now, how does this work uh, to add new phrases to the dictionary? In Lempelsif Welsh, it's done as follows. Whenever we encode a bit of the text, we add a new phrase. So each time we encode one thing, we also add one thing to the dictionary. And the rule is as follows. If we encode a substring x of s currently, so that's what's shown in the picture. The gray part is what we've already dealt with. That is encoded and done. Now I'm deciding, uh, I'll tell you in a second how, that the next thing I encode is this substring x, ban in this case. This is the next thing that we encode as one chunk, as one phrase. Um, and the reason is it occurred already in the text earlier. What we do now, uh, if we store such a phrase x, we add to the dictionary a phrase that is one character longer. We take the phrase we've just uh, stored, ban, uh, and we add one more character, which is this c, so in this banna, in this case. Okay, that's it. Uh, that's the rule. Whenever you store something, you take the next character that you could not, at the moment, already encode alongside with this, and uh, you add this one longer phrase, one character longer phrase to the dictionary. Uh, this new phrase is assigned the next free code word um, just by adding it at the end. That naturally happens. Uh, and that's, that's the core of Lempelsif Welsh. It's a fairly simple method. Now, I haven't told you yet uh, how to select x, how to find x. Um, and uh, the deal with that is you just check your dictionary and you find the longest thing you could uh, match in your dictionary. And uh, because we start with all the characters, you can always find such a match. We'll see an example where this becomes very clear. Uh, just a, a, little, a, a little side remark. Um, if, we would, if we are implementing this, we would not store the string in the dictionary uh, explicitly, but instead we, uh, we would compress this in the following sense that uh, whenever we used x, we know we have a code word for x. And so we can just store that code word and the new character. So we don't have to store very long strings in this dictionary. That's, a, that's an implementation detail that uh, we might not uh, care at the moment so much for. Let's go through uh, an example to see how this works and uh, also see how uh, we find x on an example. I said um, it's the, the longest string that you currently have in your dictionary that you find at this position. Um, 
And let's let's practice that on an example. So here's our input, yo, you, yo, yo, yo. Uh, and uh, we will build the code text uh, one by one. We'll start, in this case, I'll, I'll just assume the full ASCII character set as the alphabet. Um, then uh, we get a more realistic feel for how big the, the dictionary gets. Uh, we only use the ASCII set, not uh, full Unicode. So the first, the first part of our dictionary is already filled with all those uh, individual characters. And I'm, I'm only listing those that occur in, in our example text. Uh, we include all of them here because we want a generic compression method that works for any text file and not just for those that are comprised of these uh, few letters. Okay, so what do we do first? We try to find the longest phrase in our dictionary that starts uh, at the beginning of our text, at, of the uncoded part. At the moment, we haven't coded anything, so we're at the beginning. We only have single characters in our dictionary at the moment, so the longest thing we can find possibly is just the Y. And so we look up in the dictionary that this is uh, 89. So we would first uh, store 89 as our first code word and then um, move on with the next phrase. But before we do that, we have to add a new phrase to the dictionary. Remember, whenever we add, we encode something, we add a new phrase with the one bigger, one uh, more character added to it. So the first thing we add here is, is yo, because the next character is an O. Okay, that's how it goes. Um, next thing, we start again from here, read the longest thing we find in our dictionary. Well, we haven't seen so much, so that's just a single O. Uh, so we put that here, but then before we go, before we move on, also add the one longer uh, next uh, longer uh, phrase is O with the exclamation mark. So that goes here and takes up the next slot in the dictionary. Okay, you see how this goes. Um, as long as we haven't seen much, uh, the method is fairly boring. Uh, we, we find the longest is the exclamation mark, single character. We add exclamation mark space to the dictionary as the next phrase. Uh, and we continue one more time. So here again, space, we haven't seen anything with space before. So the longest matches this, the single character, uh, but we add um, space Y to the dictionary because that's uh, the next character. Now things slightly uh, start to slightly become more interesting because now uh, we've actually seen yo before. So here we have to pick the longest, uh, we, want, we want the longest match in the dictionary that we can find at this position. Uh, and that indeed is, is this yo. So here uh, we use this new character, this, this new code word that stands for a phrase we haven't initially had in the dictionary, but it's uh, a substring of our text. But we do the same thing. Um, we store this phrase, it represents those two characters, yo, uh, and we add you to the dictionary because that's the next character, yo plus one, one more character. All right, see how this goes and see how this eventually starts to save space as you see more and more of the text. If these things show up again, you will um, represent larger and larger parts with the same fixed length uh, code words. All right. Um, we go on the U we haven't seen, so uh, there's just the, the single character match, but we add uh, U exclamation mark to the dictionary um, for later use. Uh, now, now comes another interesting one, uh, the exclamation mark space, we have seen that before. So we can use that and uh, there's no longer match, so that's the one we take. So we use this, this code and add a new entry to our dictionary where we have exclamation mark space and then the next character is a Y again. Okay. Now things get again interesting. We have Y in the dictionary, we have YO in the dictionary, but we also have U in the dictionary. So here we can encode three letters with just one shot. Um, and uh, add the next character as a phrase to the dictionary. So here is your. All right. Uh, 
R we haven't seen, so that will be just the single character. Um, but we add to the dictionary R space. Um, next thing, uh, we've seen space Y. And that's the longest match. So we can encode that together and store space Y O in the dictionary. Now I'll move myself to the other side. Uh, and then we're almost done. Um, o, we have only seen O exclamation mark so far. So we are back to a single character, but we would add uh, the O Y for future use. And then here, uh, the Y O we've seen, but not followed by an exclamation mark. So um, we've only got this one here. And we would add the other thing to the dictionary and finally encode the exclamation mark. So this is uh, the final uh, result. That's the encoded text for yo, 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 yo. Uh, and the decoding essentially works in the same way where you have to uh, replay this game. But first of all, um, if you have questions about the encoding part, this is a good point uh, to discuss them. And if they only come up later, then uh, we'll talk about them as they arise. Uh, here's a, a more structured pseudocode, how this um, would be implemented. Um, what I didn't talk about here is, I did this manually finding the longest match that's currently in our dictionary. But we know a good data structure for doing that, and that is a try. So for encoding, um, we definitely want to represent the dictionary as a try. Because then um, you, can, you can start at the root and traverse down from the current position in the text onwards and see how far you can get. And as soon as there's no more outgoing arc with the right character, you know uh, you're at the longest match. Now, unlike in the suffix tree applications and all examples of tries we've seen so far, here we actually want strings that are prefixes of each other. In fact, we will always have uh, strings uh, of single characters, so we must have we must allow these. So here we would have space goes to one node, and uh, that, for example, is labeled with 32. But we could also continue reading space y. And I think that's the only character. So with space y, we get to another node, uh, 131. Uh, and there's also space y o, which gets us here. 137. So if we read in our text, suppose we're again at this position, we would now start traversing from the root downwards. Uh, reading characters as long as we can. So we can read the space, we can read the y, and we can read the o, so we would stop at this position. But if we were, for example, um, well, uh, suppose the text would continue with um, y i, uh, then you would start reading the space and the y, and then you were you would get stuck in this case. So you still need to have the shorter. Um, strings in your dictionary because you sometimes need them and then extend the dictionary with the i with a new uh, with a new code word after you've after you've added this okay uh, so that's that's the motivation here um, and that's that's reflected in this code so uh, the code starts with initially an empty phrase we have nothing seen the coded text is also empty, and the dictionary is initialized as a try containing just the single character strings. Um, the next free code word is always stored in K, and then we walk through um, the positions in the text. What's the next symbol of the text we have to encode? 
we get that symbol. Now we try to find um, XC in the dictionary. That essentially is walking down the try along the next character. If we can find this, then uh, we keep that, but we're not necessarily done yet. We have to continue with the next character. Uh, so we start, we continue traversing the try as long as we find matches. And the first time we fail to extend the current match, we don't find a longer string in the dictionary. That's when we get into this else branch. So here we uh, append the code word for what we currently have read, x. That's the, uh, the prefix, the phrase we found. And we add to the dictionary this one longer phrase. And we assign it the next free code word. That's, that's exactly what we did in the example, a bit more structured. And uh, if you use a try for the dictionary, this is also efficient. This traversal can always be done in constant time for the next character. All right. We can, uh, we can now encode with Lempels if Welsh and uh, achieve great compression. But of course, a compression algorithm is only useful if we can also decode it. So in the next part, we will look at how to decode with Lempels if Welsh, how to decode the output of the encoder. As always, the two steps, encoding and decoding, they have to stay in sync. They have to replay the same game. Uh, and in this case, it's growing the dictionary. So whenever we decode something, we have to add the next bigger thing into the dictionary. Uh, and for decoding, um, this looks as follows. Um, if we currently decoded x, this uh, ban, that's the last thing we decoded. We know in the encoding step, when we encoded ban, we added ban plus the next character to the dictionary. So we also have to do this now. And uh, so we, uh, we take um, the next character from the next phrase. So we have to decode one more phrase before we can do this addition in the dictionary. So we decode the next phrase and take the first character. Then we know what the XC used to be in the encoding phase, and we can add that to the dictionary. So in a sense, uh, we're lagging one step behind. But other than that, um, we're, we're replaying the same game. We always have to deal with uh, two phrases. We encode one, then we encode the next one. And that's when we can deal with the addition to the dictionary of the first phrase. So we only start adding to the dictionary after the second phrase is decoded. Let's see an example for how this works. Um, and to make it a bit more fun, this is just showing the coded text. And you will only learn what the uh, decoded text is as we go along to make this a little more interesting. So how, would, how should we start? Uh, remember, we cannot add to the dictionary at the beginning. What we start with is a dictionary that's filled with the single character strings. So the first step must be a code word that's already in our dictionary. And in this case, we find it's a C. So uh, the first character decodes to a C. So far, so good. Now we cannot handle the addition. When we encoded C, we added a new phrase to the dictionary. We cannot do that yet. We need the next character. So we decode the next phrase. Um, that is the 65 goes to an A. And now we know Z was C was followed by an A at the time of encoding. So C A was added as the first non-trivial phrase to the dictionary. And uh, well, in the computer, it would be stored like this um, because we only have to represent the code word for this potentially long repeated thing. In this case, it's a single character, so it doesn't matter much, but uh, just for completeness. But it's, it's enough for us now uh, to focus on this, on this column. So we've added a new phrase to the dictionary and assigned it the next free code, code word 128. Now we decode the next thing. Uh, it's again a single character string found in the original dictionary. We add this. Now we know a n after a when we encoded this, it was followed by n. So we would have added a n to the dictionary. So we also have to do that now and assign it the next free uh, code word. Let's continue. Um, the same thing happens. We decode a single character and add this n space to the dictionary. And another time, um, and then the things start to get interesting. 
So uh, 66 is a B. The last uh, character was a space. So space B was added uh, at the time when the space was encoded. Okay. So far it was fairly boring. We only used the original dictionary, but now things become interesting because the next is a code word above 128. So here we use what we previously added to the dictionary. So the, the text so far uh, reads like can ban. Um, and uh, we know the last phrase was a B. The first character from the new phrase is an A. So we would have added BA at the time of encoding to the dictionary. So we have to do that now as well. And so we move along and uh, until, oops, until we run into the situation that we're trying to use a code that is the next free one and we don't know what it decodes to yet. So it seems uh, like uh, we're stuck in a dead end uh, because we, we would need the information that the encoder put in after encoding this phrase but we only get to that information after decoding this next phrase. So how, how can we uh, get out of this, this problem? So that's a tricky situation that arises in Lempels if Welsh encoding. Uh, but fortunately, by looking very closely at this specific situation, we can actually resolve it. Let's uh, zoom out a bit and see what happened. The reason why uh, we ran into this problem is that the decoder is one step behind. The encoder encodes a phrase and then adds that phrase plus the next character to the, dic character to the dictionary. When we decode, we cannot do this because we don't know the next character yet. We have to wait for the next uh, phrase to be decoded and then we can add it to the dictionary. But uh, it might occasionally happen that the phrase that we just inserted into the dictionary is the one that we use next in the encoding. And in that case, we're in this, in this dead end. So we are trying to use a code that we are just about to build to insert into the dictionary. Uh, the good thing is by looking carefully, this is something we can actually handle because we have all the information that we need. So we decode using k in the step that will define k. So we definitely add something to the dictionary after this step. And that would be the one, the thing that we need. We know the last phrase x, but we don't know uh, the next phrase y yet. We would need it to insert it into the dictionary and then use it immediately. But we have seen x, so that's where we decode it already. And the fact that the encoder used, um, uses the same phrase that we just create means that the last phrase plus the first character, that's the x c that we added, must also be what comes now, right? In the, in the encoder, we used this Anna right after we inserted it. So Anna was the thing that we inserted, x plus the next character. And this is what we used. So we know that this is the same thing. And in particular, the first character here, the C, must actually match the first character of X. So we know this, um, that the next, the next entry in the dictionary, XC, must actually be X followed by the first character in X. So it always has this little self-similarity in it because of this overlap. So this situation can arise. It can happen as we've seen in the example, but if it arises, we actually know what to do. So it's not a problem after all. Um, here's the, the full code where you see how this is handled. Uh, and the interesting case is this, um, where we have to pull ourselves on our own bootstrap out of the swamp um, by, by using this special case. As you can see here, we use the first character of X. Um, maybe let me first finish the example and then uh, I'll show you the rest of the code in slightly more detail. So here again <clears throat> is our situation. Um, and uh, that's, that's how it, it is resolved. At the point where we decode 133, 
we had not filled it yet. So that means we don't we didn't know what this is. This was unclear. But we knew the last phrase was x, and that's indeed exactly the example that I drew here um, also in this in this diagram. We knew x was a n, so the first character of a n is a, so the next phrase must have been Anna. So we can resolve this here and we can also at the same time insert it into the dictionary and everything's fine. And from then on uh, we can uh, decode as usual. So let's briefly look again at the code, um, how this uh, can be spelled out in a little more uh, systematic way. Again, um, we need a proper data structure for the dictionary for this to be efficient. Unlike before where we used the try, here we actually need to find the meaning of a code word given the code word. And that is actually much easier. So we can just use an array in this, uh, where we use the index, the code word as an index, and then the entry in the array is just the, well, the phrase um, encoded as, as we've seen before. So we have uh, similar variables as before, the next uh, free code word. Uh, the, first, uh, the first code word in the coded text that we're, the next thing that we're decoding. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the next phrase. And uh, initially, well, we start with the, whatever the first phrase is. And uh, then we walk through all the, the codes, the code words. We remember in X the last decoded phrase. So we always need X and Y, remember? Then we decode one more. Um, that's, the, that's the next code word from the coded text. And then there's two possibilities. If we're in this weird special situation that what we want to look up now is what we would fill after this step. We have this special bootstrap case and we know what y has to be. Otherwise, y is just looked up in the dictionary. We know the next phrase then. And so in both cases, we know x and y now. And so we can uh, add y to the decoded text. We know y now, that's the next, uh, the next phrase we looked up. And we add the new thing to the dictionary, which is x plus the first character of y. Uh, and this, this handles both cases now because we assigned y in the right way. So that's, that's all there is to Lempels of Welch decoding. Um, if you use an array here, it's, it's very efficient. Decoding is a tiny bit more efficient than encoding, uh, as we've seen before for Huffman. And indeed, this is, this is very fast um, and can be implemented. Uh, even even in hardware devices, that's how the this patent came first into existence. And uh, in one way, or in one variant or another, Lempelsif Welsh is is below all all zip variants that are out there, and uh, is very effective on many types of data. So before we discuss a little bit more what Lempels if Welsh is like. Um, here's a, a fairly tricky question just to see if you're uh, digesting this well. So this, this is tough, but it's an extreme case of a repetitive text. We have uh, just n copies of A. And I'd like to know what would Lempels if Welsh do on such an input? In a sense, it's the ultimate repetitive input. There's nothing more repetitive than just writing the same character over and over again. Um, remember something like uh, run length encoding would really compress this uh, very well. Um, and it's an interesting question to ask yourself, what would Lempels if Welsh behave like? What would happen? I didn't have an opening question today, so uh, I don't know for how many people we are waiting today, but I, I would definitely hope for at least 20 or maybe 25 as usual. So I'll give you a little bit of time. It's also a question you actually have to think about a bit more. It might be more suited for a tutorial problem, but the tutor tutorial was already full. 
And so uh, I left it in the lecture. We have 70 people. Eighteen, twenty, nineteen. I'll wait a little more. Um, give you a second here. We're not in a big rush. So I'd love to see twenty five, that's for sure. And I'll explain what the correct answer is after the after we we've seen the votes. Can we get two more people? Doesn't look like it. Oh, there they go. Of course. Uh, great. Um, so let's see. Let me lock in the results. And uh, indeed, the correct answer, the single correct answer is is this last one. Is this, uh, well, the last one on the first page, uh, square root of n. Uh, it's an interesting thing to uh, look at. So let me move back to this. And you might wonder why on earth square root of n. And to see this, you basically have to simulate the algorithm a little bit. Uh, so let's try to do this just on a, on a small example where I use some n's, uh, some small n, and we'll look what happens. Um, when we start, the dictionary only contains the single characters, so we would encode this as a phrase. And we would add AA to the dictionary. We would always be in this weird bootstrap case for this example. So we would always, in the decoding phase, we would always need this uh, special case, but that's um, beside the point. The next thing we would read is AA, because that's in the dictionary, and we would insert AAA. So the next thing would be these three characters, and then, well, maybe I can add this so after the three we would insert four and then we find this as the last phrase so what you see is that with every phrase the length of the phrase goes up by one so uh, the total length of the string if i have k phrases say With k phrases, I would go from length 1 up to length k. And I would sum up this. So n would be something like this, except for the last phrase, maybe. But let's uh, suppose it's k full phrases. Um, so you would, you would have this sum. And as you know, this is uh, quadratic. It's... Well, we can say it precisely in this case. Um, not that it helps too much. K, K plus one half. So this is the famous uh, little Gauss formula. And if you solve for K, uh, I mean, this is, this is essentially quadratic. So if you solve for K, this is square root N. You need square root N phrases to cover N copies of A. Uh, might be interesting to remark that run length encoding got this log n, which is the number of bits you need to specify the length of the string. So that's uh, it's hard to imagine that you can ever beat this log n here for that very special case. Uh, but lambelsif Welch at least gets down to square root n, which is way, way better than linear. Whereas uh, the best you could achieve with Huffman coding is, is n bits, right? So there's no way you get sublinear. Um, if you just use Huffman for individual symbols. Okay, cool. That was, uh, that was that question. So keep that in mind. This is essentially also the, um, the best case for lempelsiv Welsh. You, can, you cannot really get better than square root n, but that is pretty good. So uh, it's a decent, um, it's a decent uh, best case. 
run length encoding is really extreme. Good. Uh, square root n can sometimes be achieved. Usually, you don't quite get that. Um, but you often get uh, either a very good constant factor or sometimes even slightly sublinear. What is Lampels of Welsh, Welsh uh, good for? Um, we've seen that uh, we use as coded alphabet this, um, this range 0 up to 2 to the d. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's fine. That is binary. So you, you can use it as uh, I presented it. Um, but Often, you will not use all of the code words with equal frequency or equally likely. And uh, then it might help to, as a second step after Lempelsiv Welsh, when you encode uh, the phrases just using the dictionary index, it might be a, a smart idea to use a Huffman code on top of that so uh, that you don't just get the reduction from long phrases being represented by a fixed length thing, but also if phrases are used with different frequencies, you also exploit that. So that's a, a typical thing you will see again and again in compression. Uh, you chain these methods one after the other to improve compression and get the, the last little bit of redundancy squeezed out. What I didn't talk about so far is what do we do if the dictionary is full? I said we use a fixed length um, for the for the code words, but we also add another phrase when we use uh, when we encode it with one phrase. So we have to do something. Eventually, the dictionary will be full, and then we have different options. We can actually decide that we then double the size of the dictionary, make uh, d one bigger. That uh, is a solution, but it means over the long term um, that your your code words always get one bit longer, and um, maybe that is detrimental. Another idea is to just start from scratch, throw the dictionary away, start again with single uh, characters, and uh, go from there. Um, that's nice because it limits the working memory that you need. Remember, for encoding and decoding, you have to keep the dictionary in main memory. And if you do this on a small, uh, on a small device uh, when streaming uh, internet traffic, say, you might uh, want to limit this. So that's something that's often done. Um, a little bit, uh, a hack in between is to reserve a special code word that doesn't really encode anything in the text, but signals to the decoder, please now flush your dictionary and start from scratch. I did the same. So these are, these are things you can play with. Uh, and the dictionary size is something, if you, uh, if you call a compression method a zip variant, they often allow you to say how big the dictionary should be. And that's a, a, cons a, a parameter you can play with. OK, with the data structures that we've seen, we can do encoding and decoding in linear time, uh, at least when the alphabet is constant, um, an assumption we often make for, for compression here. And um, so that is very fast. And it can also be done without um, seeing the entire text in advance. Remember, Huffman had this issue that you have to count the frequencies first. Uh, if we use Huffman for the dictionary codes, of course, we inherit this restriction. What is often done is you use Lempelsiv Welch for a certain period of uh, the text and the, for a certain block length, and then you start from scratch. That goes hand in hand with flushing the dictionary, for example. It does achieve very good compression for many typical kinds of data. Uh, so typical, I will always have these two examples, English language text or natural language text in a, in a Western language. Uh, or um, biological sequences. And uh, Lempelsi Felsch turns out to work well for these, often achieving uh, reductions um, of more than one half, of more than a factor two. Um, what is somewhat of a downside, uh, at least from the typical implementations, if you fix the size of the dictionary, if there's a a repetition, but that's very, very far spread out in the in the input text, you might not catch it because you flushed your dictionary before you could see it. Uh, 
also the the square root n is is uh, I said is a is a decent lower bound, but it's not the best possible in some scenarios as we've seen. Um, so these are slight um, slight downsides, but it's a very solid method that is uh, in wide use. I have a last slide on on this part uh, where we have a little comparison of these uh, three methods that we've seen. Huffman codes, run length encoding, and lempulsive Welsh. Um, most of the things that are in here uh, we already discussed when we were um, when we were discussing these methods in more detail. Um, and this also gives some some typical applications and uh, some numbers for English text, where you see Huffman is actually not too bad if you start with ASCII, but then Lempelsif Welsh gets it down a good bit more. And uh, yeah, here are some, some things where it's applied. Uh, I think Huffman codes are very ubiquitous in, in all kinds of formats, but just as a piece of it. So that's a little, uh, with that little summary of the three main methods we've seen so far, I want to conclude this, this subsection.